Wow, I love to worship with you. I love to sing the truth that the blood of Christ has washed away our sin, that the curse of sin is gone. That is the good news that we have come today to proclaim and to celebrate and to believe and to apply that whatever has happened in your life, whatever sin you are guilty of, whatever others may have done to you, you are free because of what Jesus has done. And that is good news. Now we come today to Luke chapter 10 and I, I'm, I'm going to try and cover a lot of territory uh, and I'm going to do it a little bit differently today. I'm going to not read all 24 verses together, but there are four movements in this text. You can see those reflected in the title of the sermon, releasing, rejecting, returning, and revealing. So let's begin, and we're going to read the first movement is the, in the first 12 verses. As Jesus now sends out not the 12, but the 72. Read with me beginning in verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to throw out, to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. Greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter into a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. You know, a few months ago, we did an event here. We call it Reach Frankfurt. We like to do things to, to reach and to serve our city. We have Serve Frankfurt. We do projects that benefit different uh, people and organizations throughout Frankfurt. But we also like to reach people. I don't want anybody within a certain radius of our church saying, look at those people. They built that big building up there, but they've, they've never come and shown any care for me. I think it's important that we personally go to every house within a certain radius of our church and just let them know we're here. Just let them know that we want to serve them. We want to minister to them. So every so often we do reach Frankfurt. We did it a few months ago. And uh, I don't know, something like 80, 90 people gathered here on a Saturday morning. And, you know, it's, it's so fun for me as a pastor to gather with people as they're about to go out. People are quiet. They're, you know, I can tell, I can read their minds. People are like, you know, I, I'm doing this out of obedience to the Lord. I don't want anybody going to hell because I didn't show up on Saturday morning, but, but they're sort of scared. They're sort of nervous. But man, about three hours later or so, when we all come back, I stand there at the door watching people. And I know what's in their heart and their mind because Tanya and I, we, we went into Duckers and we went up and down a street and Knocked on a lot of doors that morning. And, you know, it, it, was, it was fun because uh, nobody was unkind to us. There were some people that were uninterested. That, that's fine. We still let them know that we're here. It was really great, though, seeing the reaction. I want you to know what a reputation you have because so often when, you know, people would open the door and they'd look and they'd be a little bit uh, leery, you know, a little bit suspicious. And we'd say, uh, 
I always let Tanya do the talking. She just looks better than me, you know, and she say, uh, she'd say, I'm Tanya, this is Herschel, and we're from Buck Run Baptist Church. The minute we would say Buck Run Baptist Church, people would light up. They would have a smile. And so many of them would say, oh, I know so-and-so that goes to your church, or my oncology nurse went to, that goes to your church. And they would begin to tell us stories of people in Buck Run who had ministered to them. Every now and then we'd run into somebody and, and they would be troubled and they'd say, would you pray for me? And we would so happily pray with them, someone that had a need that we could care for or meet. And when we got back that day and people began, began to come in with those stories, it was such a thrill for me as a pastor to see that this is exactly what Jesus felt, sending out, first of all, remember chapter 9 began with Jesus sending out the 12. Now that's multiplied by six and he's sending out the 72 and they're going out into those villages around Galilee and uh, and notice this is Jesus releasing them into ministry and that is one of the marks the hallmarks of discipleship what it means to be a disciple following Jesus means being sent Jesus doesn't ask us to follow him merely for the purpose of us getting to be close to him, but so that we can bring others to him as well. And so in these instructions that Jesus gives the, the 72, he defines really what disciples look like. First of all, notice Jesus is very candid and he says disciples are outnumbered. He says, I, I'm, I'm sending you out into a harvest that has a much greater need than simply the few of you that I'm sending out. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send others out as well. They're, the laborers are few. Not only are they few, their disciples are in danger. <clears throat> Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. You know, not, sometimes in nature you see things that are natural enemies. But uh, the thing about sheep and wolves is sheep, are defenseless. You never saw on National Geographic an epic battle between a sheep and a wolf, right? That, no sheep is hiding, you know, getting up on its uh, hindquarters and attacking the wolf. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't do anything. They, they just get eaten. They're defenseless. Jesus said, that's what it's like. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And you see this theme throughout the, the Bible, Psalm 44, Verse 22, the, there the, the Israelites say, for your sake we're slaughtered all the day long. In Romans 8, Paul picks up that very theme. He says, that's exactly right. We are slaughtered all day long for your sake. But the fact that it's for your sake is what proves that nothing can separate us from the love of God. We are more than conquerors. Even when we're outnumbered, even when we are hated, even when we are attacked and in danger, because what this reminds us is that disciples are completely dependent. Jesus gives a fourfold prohibition. Don't carry a money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. Don't, don't take any extra shoes with you. Don't greet anybody on the road. What Jesus is saying is you're com we're completely dependent and we have an urgent mission. You know, uh, it's sometimes possible that as we say we're going in the name of Jesus, that we're stopping and greeting so many believers along the way that we make it about our fellowship more than we make it about our witness. And, you know, there are some churches that are dying from the disease of koinonitis. They're, they're all fellowship and no evangelism. Uh, their ministries all focus inward and not outward. They're, Oh, we love what we've got. I don't know if uh, you watch my podcast called Pastor Well, but this week I had uh, an interview with Bob Russell, the former senior minister at uh, Southeast Christian. And he and I were talking about what happens as a church grows and those original people that you pastored. And sometimes people say, you know, I'm glad we're reaching people, but I don't want us to get too big. And Bob said that he would say to them, well, aren't you glad somebody didn't feel that way before you came to the church? You know, what they mean is make sure you're 
you're meeting my needs. But, you know, that's not the primary purpose of the church. We're to go out. We're to reach out. Jesus is not saying anything about the needs of the disciples here. He's, he's putting them on uh, calculated deficits. There are a lot of things you're to do without as you go out in my name. You, your mission is urgent. Don't even stop and greet people along the way. Don't die of koinonitis. That's not the purpose. That's not the mission right now. But when you go to a place, and he said, you're, you're emissaries of peace. Now, this is interesting. We sort of take this for granted as though we think that the, the task of disciples is about bringing peace. But remember, this is in a messianic context. And when you read in the Old Testament about the prophecies of the Messiah coming, and the Messiah is going to do what? He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats. And for the Messiah, the harvest is what? It's a time of judgment. You can read in the book of Joel how, how it's prophesied there that the Messiah is going to come and sit in the valley of Jehoshaphat and judge the nations and he's going to put in his sickle and he's going to have a harvest of wrath. So this is the Jewish expectation that when the Messiah comes, he's bringing wrath. It's going to be a harvest of souls, but it's going to be brought by blood. And Jesus upends this expectation. He says, indeed, it's a harvest and the Messiah has come. Your job, your task is to tell people that the kingdom of God has come. And, but you're to tell them that it's a mission of peace right now. Peace be upon your house. And if indeed in there they receive you, if they are sons of peace, then that peace will remain on their house. If they reject you, then you go on down the road, go to some other house, and your peace will leave them. Now, do you see what Jesus is doing? He's saying that he is the Messiah, that he's the one who is separating. He's dividing the audience. He's dividing the people between those who receive his peace and those who do not. And the harvest is beginning, but it is not yet the harvest of judgment. However, the judgment they will receive one day is going to depend on whether or not they receive his disciples today. Do you see that? If they reject you, my peace, that peace is going to leave them. That peace will remain with you, Jesus says. You go on. But that means they're not a son of peace. They've rejected you. And Jesus goes on to say, if they reject you, they reject me. And if they reject me, they've rejected the one who sent me. So his messianic mission is indeed what they expected in the Old Testament. It's just going to be drawn out through centuries. It's not happening all at once. See, you and I are going as disciples, and this is what we're doing. We're, we're looking for sons and daughters of peace, a person of peace. Isn't that exactly what Paul did in his missionary journeys? He would go into a city. He would often try and go to the synagogue first, and there he would find somebody that's looking for the Messiah. And he would tell them about the, the, the Jewish expectation of the Messiah and that Jesus had indeed come and fulfilled that. When he went into a city where there was no synagogue like at Philippi, he went to a place where they would offer prayers and he found there Lydia, a seller of purple. And she was receptive. She was a person of peace. And she became the first convert in Europe. Now see, when missionaries go, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for a person of peace, someone that will receive them and then become the basis from which they can reach others. Years and years ago, almost now 100 years ago, uh, there was a missionary in western Brazil named Joe Brandon, and he went into the state of Acre. Uh, right now on Netflix, there's a, there's a, a documentary about this, uh, the, the tribes that they've discovered in Acre. I mean, it's so remote. Acre, the westernmost uh, state in Brazil, they still find isolated people there that have really no contact with the outside world. And Joe Brandon went there 
to the state of Acre, and he found a family. I don't know the old guy's name. I have pictures of him. 1960, my dad, John Hatcher, who's David Hatcher's dad, and Bobby Craiglow, who's Mike Craiglow, who pastors First Baptist Church of, of Cruzeiro do Sul now, his dad. They went to Cruzeiro do Sul, and they met with this old guy. He, they called him the old patriarch, and he'd been evangelized by, by Joe Brandon. The missionary had been there decades before them, and he and his family uh, had uh, a lot of, uh, they had, we had a lot of kids. I actually met one of them in Manaus uh, probably 15 years ago. And this family was just huge, but they remained faithful. And the old patriarch discipled his children, and he tried to reach people. And in 1960, three missionaries go there, and Bobby Craiglow feels the need to move there. And so he moves his family to Cruzeiro do Sul, and using the old patriarch as the sort of the, the, the point of contact between him and the locals, they, they build a church. They reach people. Today, Mike Craiglow, this many years later, still pastors, First Baptist Church of Cruzeiro do Sul, and has reached indigenous peoples, and people there in Cruzeiro do Sul. It's an incredible story of the gospel. It's one of those missionary stories that only heaven will really tell. And it happened because there was a person of peace that Joe Brandon reached, and God used that man and his family to now build really an entire network of churches reaching multitudes with the gospel. This is what we're looking for. You know, sometimes we think, we make it feel like we're looking for multitudes. But the reality is when we go out, we're not looking for multitudes. We're looking for one. We're just, we're just looking for the one door we knock on where there's a person of peace. You're looking for that one person you work with who one day says to you, you go to church, don't you? I noticed that that Bible you keep with you, you, it looks pretty well worn. You're a Christian, right? I mean, you're, you're looking for the person who shows interest. And we're not searching for multitudes, we're searching for one. We're looking for that son or daughter of peace because we're emissaries of peace. But disciples are also focused on the task. When Jesus said, greet no one on the road, he's saying, make sure that you keep in your heart and in your mind what I'm sending you to do. Don't get distracted. Don't suffer from coinonitis while others are going to hell because disciples are focused on the task and disciples are bringing the kingdom. So he said, you go into that town, <clears throat> you, you go into whatever house receives you, you eat whatever they put before you, and, uh, and if they won't receive you, the whole town rejects you. Now, by the way, remember, we saw last week at the end of chapter 9 that Jesus wanted to go into that village in Samaria and the whole town rejected him. And he did not call fire down from heaven. John, remember, John and James wanted to call fire down. Jesus said, no, he, he just went on. But the fact that they rejected him was a testimony against them. And so Jesus says, if they don't receive you, and you go right out there into the street and you tell them, look, we're going to leave, but we're shaking the very dust off of our sandals as a testimony against you. The kingdom has come near you, and you did not receive it. Now, what's Jesus doing? He's establishing, if you will, a case against them. That I came to you and offered you grace. I offered you an opportunity of repentance and salvation, and you would not receive it. But you see, this is exactly what you and I do. We're, we're not trying to convince somebody of a philosophy. We're not helping people know how to manage life better. We're bringing the kingdom of God. There are all kinds of self-help gurus that can help people have a better marriage and uh, run their business better. And though I believe Christianity will do that too, that's not our purpose. That's not what we're out to do. We're bringing the rule, the reign of God into the lives of people. We're offering them an eternal difference. And we are preaching for a decision. There is no third category. They either accept or they reject. Peace either 
abides or it departs. Jesus is very clear. Here he is fulfilling that messianic mandate that the the king is coming to judge the nations. He's separating the wheat from the chaff and the sheep from the goats. That's what you and I do. By the way, guess what we're going to do on August the 17th? We're having another reach Frankfurt. And let me just ask you, let's compare our church to a department store. Would we just all show up for work nine o'clock one morning, lock the doors and sell merchandise to each other? What, what kind of a business would that be? Hey, we, let's just show up and sell each other shirts and pants and underwear. What? Your business isn't going to thrive if that's what you're doing, right? We're, we're here to, to share the gospel with people out there. I love the worship, don't you? I love being in God's house with God's people. But don't for a moment think this is our primary mission. Our primary mission is to be the emissaries of peace who go out there and tell people about the kingdom of God. And we preach for a decision. If, if you leave here today merely comfortable, and not faced with the stark decision that you are either a follower of Jesus or you are a rejecter of Jesus, then I have not done my job. This is the message of the first movement. And notice how on the, the note that Jesus strikes at the end of it in verse 12, he says, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day. What day? The day of the Lord, the day of judgment. The day when he sits in the valley of Jehoshaphat and judges the nations is going to be more, it's going to be more tolerable on that day. It's going to be easier on that day for Sodom than for the town that rejects the kingdom. So this introduces the second movement, verses 13 through 16. Let's read it. Now Jesus turns from the disciples to those cities around Galilee where he's sending them. And he pronounces these woes. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum? Now remember, this is where Jesus called this is where Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. This is where Jesus went into the synagogue. This is where Jesus has healed the sick. And now to this town that he has graced with his favor and whose citizens he has healed and delivered, he pronounces woe on them. Woe to you, Capernaum. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. Jesus is warning here that rejecting Jesus means being judged. Now, there's a word that is loaded. People don't like that. People, don't, people say, no judgment. You know, I, I, recently I've seen people with tattoos that say, uh, only God can judge me. And I always want to stop them and say, does that comfort you? <laughs> that, that should not be a comfort to you. I agree with the sentiment, by the way. Only God can judge you, and he will. Uh, what, you know, we, we think we can strut through life not caring what people think because, you know, it's okay between me and God. Oh, it's only okay between you and God if you have come before him in repentance and faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus makes that so plain. Re rejecting Jesus means being judged. You can go through life saying, no judgment. Don't judge me. You can say that to me. You can say that to the person sitting beside you. You can say it to your spouse. You can say it to your children. You can say it to your parents. 
you cannot say it to God because he has not only the right to judge you, but he has declared that he's going to judge you. See, Jesus sends out the 72, but now he pauses to tell us what's at stake. Judgment is coming. And the prophetic word of warning goes with the messianic invitation to the kingdom. You can't have one without the other. Uh, I, a friend of mine uh, has been had the occasion to worship in several different churches recently. And he told me, you know, how disconcerting it is to hear a pastor preach a sermon and never yet, never ever tell people to, to repent and to believe. And they give this generic invitation of sorts that says, hey, make Jesus your best friend. Just say yes to Jesus. And all of it sounds warm and wonderful, but this is not the message that Jesus sent the disciples with. He, he sent a message that says you either accept or you reject. He's either God's anointed whom you receive and obey, or he is the one whom you send away. Now, notice in this woe that Jesus, there, there are a lot of implications of this. I, I, I wish I had so much more time, but to get through Luke, even in two years, I'm really having to keep the pace up. But I, I don't want us to miss the implications of what Jesus says in these woes. First of all, do you notice that this means there are degrees of sin? Don't, don't, don't fail to see that. If Jesus says it's going to be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom and for Tyre and Sidon than for these villages that have seen him and seen his works and heard the gospel proclaimed that there that means that this sin is worse here's a sin that is worse and the Jews thought and what most Christians sort of think we think of Sodom and Gomorrah as the the pinnacle of evil what's the worst place in the Bible Sodom and Gomorrah We've used that even as an adjective of people and deviant acts. We, we, we've no, made Sodom notorious in history. And here Jesus comes along and says, oh, there's something so much worse than what they did at Sodom. Unbelief is the great sin. You see that? Unbelief is the great sin. We... If we reject the good news of the gospel, that's an even greater sin than any sexual sin, than any sin against any other human being. I mean, and that is not to lessen those sins. Those are sins and they are heinous. But the sin of rejecting Jesus, the sin of unbelief is the great sin. And you've got to see the other implication with this that not only are, are there degrees of sin, there are degrees of punishment. Jesus says it will be more tolerable. And, and that, you got to believe that on the day of judgment, it's not, not going to be real tolerable for Sodom. It's not going to be really tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. Read the prophecies against Tyre and Sidon in the, the major and the minor prophets. Read what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. And yet Jesus said it's going to be more tolerable on the day of judgment for those cities than for these cities that heard the gospel and rejected it. We should also note that Jesus is speaking collectively to cities. Why does he do that, not individuals? Because Jesus is telling us that culture influences individuals. There is a collective guilt. There's a lot of talk these days about we can't repent for the sin somebody else did. I, I want you to see, there's no question about it. You, you've got to repent for your sins. You've got to face God for your sins. But, you know, Daniel in Daniel 9, he identifies with the sins of his fathers. And right here, Jesus speaks collectively to people. And nobody's sticking their finger in Jesus' face saying, hey, I can't, re I can't repent for what the other folks in my city are doing. Jesus puts us together. There, is there a collective sin of America? Oh, you bet there is. There's a bunch of them. And... We are part of this culture, and if we are not actively being salt and light and speaking out against the evil, then we are complicit in it. Whether it be abortion or racism or 
hatred, whatever it might be. We can't participate with the culture. We must be completely different. And Jesus here addresses these cities, warning them unbelief is the great sin. And, re, and he's telling them that rejecting the son is worse than any other sin. Notice also he's clear here there is a hell. There is a hell. There are not many preachers who preach on hell anymore, which only tells me that Jesus would not be very popular these days because Jesus talks about hell more than any other prophet or preacher in the Bible. It's Jesus who tells us what hell is like. And clearly he says there, there is a hell. We're going to learn more about hell later in the book, but right now let it suffice to say that Jesus warns Capernaum that they think here they are, a Jewish town. They've got a synagogue. Jesus has been there healing their folk, delivering their people. They think they're on their way to heaven. But Jesus says, oh, no, you're not going to be exalted to the heavens. You're going to be brought down to Hades. There is a hell. And here's the reality. All of us, everybody, every human being is heading to hell apart from the grace of God. But those who hear and receive the good news of the gospel. They receive Jesus. They welcome him gladly. They'll be delivered from that hell they deserve. And those who reject him will bear the greatest punishment of any sin. And then Luke gives us the third movement. Now beginning in verse 17. Here's the return of of the 72. The 72 return. By the way, I'll just throw this out as an aside. Luke really likes this word return. Uh, he uses this word 33 times in Luke and Acts. It's, this word never is used in Matthew or Mark or John. And it's only three times in the whole, all the rest of the New Testament. So Luke really likes this word. There's a, a theology of return in Luke. We'll see it again in the story of the prodigal son, won't we? So just notice here, Jesus sends out and then he receives back. He, there's a return. And the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Oh, my. Wow. You know, Luke's telling us, knowing Jesus means having joy. You know, there's, there's joy in the return of these 70. They come back, they can't believe what they've seen God do. They can't believe the way God has worked through them in the name of Jesus. And there's not just joy in them, there's joy in Jesus. Man, you know, God grants success to his disciples. What we do on earth has effect in the heavenlies. When they come back, and they begin to tell Jesus what they saw, what happened, how Jesus worked through them, that even the demons were subject to them. In the, when they invoked the name of Jesus, they had authority. Jesus, that's exactly right. I've given you authority over those demons. And I've given you the authority to, to trample on serpents and scorpions, anything that plagues and harms humanity, God is ultimately against. He, he's against death and disease. He, he gave them power over death and disease. We see Jesus healing and raising from the dead. He's against the Satan and those spiritual powers in the heavenlies. He's against the brokenness and fallenness on earth. He's against the serpents and the scorpions. One of the signs of the kingdom is what? That a child will play on the hole of, of an asp and it's not going to hurt him. The, the, the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. When Jesus comes, the, the curse will be lifted and, and the brokenness of this earth is going to be vanquished and extinguished. And Jesus, when he sees the 72 come back, he gets a glimpse of the coming of his glory. And he says, I saw Satan 
fall like lightning from heaven. Man, think about the power of the gospel. Now, just a few verses earlier, James and John, what are they wanting to do? Let's call fire down on them. But what does Jesus say? No, man, don't call fire down on them. Make lightning fall. When you go out preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't you realize that your efforts here on earth have an effect in the heavenlies? Satan trembles at a Christian who has the gospel on his lips and in his heart. And the kingdom exercises authority. And Jesus says, you've got it. Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. That, Jesus says, that's not the thing. Now, you know, Christians, I, I don't know how we miss this in the scripture. You have a service where you say, we're going to have a, a healing service. You know, everybody with a goiter, show up. Everybody with arthritis, come on. We're, we're, we're going to heal you. And man, you, you can see people come far and wide and they watch that on TV and they get all excited. Do you see Jesus says, that's not the thing to get excited about? What's the thing to get excited about? You're going to heaven. Your name is written down. By the way, if God has written my name, I'm not worried about anybody else erasing it. It, 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 It's there. Man, when I get to go into the, the bedside of our members who are facing death and struggling with cancer and all kinds of maladies and to see the faith in them and You know, they want to stay. They love people. God's given them a will to live and a desire to continue to serve him. But there's a complete peace. Why? Because their name is written in heaven. See, salvation, not service, is the supreme source of joy. Uh, Don't get your self-worth from what you do. Now, Jesus is the one who sent them out and told them to do these things. So I'm not telling you not to do things. I'm just saying that that is not our identity. That's not our self-worth. My identity is not in being Herschel the preacher or the pastor of Buck Run or even the husband of Tanya. As great as all those things are, my identity is that I am in Christ. My name is written in heaven. See? Can I tell you something? Uh, Tanya and I were having supper last night, and uh, I looked at my phone, an email came through, and it was from Bob Russell. Now, I love and admire Bob Russell uh, in his incredible ministry at Southeast Christian. You know, that grew from a small church to being one of the largest churches in America. And Bob Russell wrote me an email that says, I'm listening to your sermon from last Sunday, uh, Why Disciples Fail. And he said, I'm really enjoying it. And he just sort of thanked me for his faithfulness, for my faithfulness. And boy, that blessed me. A few minutes later, another one came through. And he began to tell me how God had used my sermon to convict him of certain things in his life that he shared there. And I was, I was blessed by that. Here's Bob Russell listening to my sermon and telling me he came under conviction from what I preached. I'm not sure I came under conviction from what I preached, but <laughs> Bob Russell did. And, you know, I, I'm grateful for that. But you know what? That's not my source of joy, right? That's, I, I'm, not, I'm not who I am because of who's listening to me preach or because you're listening to me preach. I'm who I am because of whom I'm preaching. It's about Jesus. Man, he came to save us. He brought the good news. He, he's promised us heaven. He's written our name there in the Lamb's book of life. And don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Man, what is it that really makes you happy? What is it that gives you joy? I love my grandchildren. I, I love this church. I, I love I love being with Tanya. I love going to the beach. There are a lot of things that I really love, but none of them give me joy like knowing my name is written in heaven. Well, building on this then, Luke takes us to the fourth movement here. Verse 21, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. 
and said, I thank you, Father. I, I wish I could stop here. I just want you to notice the Trinitarian theology of Luke. Do you see that? Uh, I, oh, man, I just got to move on. But notice, there's the Trinity right there. Jesus, the Son, rejoicing in the Spirit and praying to the Father. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to these hapless, feckless disciples, children, little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father uh, or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Look, here's, here's Luke's theological point. He wants Theophilus to get, he wants you to get. Seeing Jesus is seeing God. Do you see this high Christology? Jesus right here in his ministry in his prayer, rejoicing in the spirit. He has seen the kingdom advancing. He's seen a foretaste of the coming kingdom. He sees Satan fall like lightning from heaven. God has cast him out. And so what, what Jesus is showing us that here as the Messiah in his work, as the Messiah who brings the kingdom that will consummate in his crucifixion and resurrection, and resurrection that Satan is now cast out of heaven. He no longer has access to heaven. All of this through the work of the Son. And Jesus, rejoicing at this, begins to praise God and to thank him. And as he thanks him, he, he equates himself with God. Don't miss that. There are liberal theologians who will Jesus never claimed to be God. I don't know how an honest reading of Luke 10 says anything else. In fact, it's so clear that uh, the Jesus Seminar, a bunch of liberal theologians who, who vote on whether or not they think Jesus actually said this stuff, said completely, there's no way Jesus said this. Now, the truth is, if Jesus isn't saying that he's God, then they've got no reason to cut it out of the Bible. The fact that they cut it out of the Bible means they do understand that's what he's saying. He's clearly saying that he is God and he inextricably binds himself to the Father and equates the reaction to him is the reaction to the Father. And, but as he says this, notice he invokes his sovereignty. You see that? He says, that, I'm so glad you've revealed this, not to the wise and people who have all this knowledge, but to little babies. You've shown this to these who are not the rabbis, not the doctors of the law, but the fishermen, the zealots, the publicans. Thank you, Lord, that you've revealed it to them. And he says, nobody sees who I am and who the Father is and except if the Son chooses to reveal it. You see that? We see Jesus not by our own intuition, or our intellectual deduction, we see Jesus by revelation. That is, this is a sovereign work of God that has to overwhelm us and, and open our hearts. Several times, Luke has already used the word concealed. Have you noticed it when we come to it? Something was concealed. Several times we've been told something was concealed from them. Here Jesus says that these things have been concealed from the wise and understanding but now the emphasis is on revelation that we have been enabled to see. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, because it absolutely precludes pride. You're not going to heaven saying, look what I was smart enough to figure out. You can only go to heaven because God was gracious to you and opened your blind eyes to see and opened your darkened mind to understand. See, this precludes pride. This causes us to wonder. Can I, let me just ask you, why did God save you? Why did he save you? What do you add to him? Does it not make you wonder why he would save you? 
why would he give his son to die for you? What an act of the grace and mercy of God that he would look at us who add nothing to his treasury. We've not had one little thought in our brains that adds anything to his wisdom. We have no strength in our limbs that contributes to his omnipotence. And yet he loved us and he saved us and he gave his son to die for us. Man, that causes wonder. And that is what motivates obedience. See, this is why we're, we're not just up here preaching rules and regulations every week. Oh, you must do this and must not do that. Here's what we're preaching. God in his sovereignty has saved you and he owns you. He's the king and uh, he's a loving king. And your best move is just to say, yes, Lord, I love you so much. I want to honor you and serve you. And whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do because I love you so much. And that is the key to holiness. And Jesus tells us, you know, Moses, Moses longed to see what you and I see. We know that just like we read the Old Testament and you just see Jesus all in it. And this is what Jesus means when he says that prophets and kings long to see what now God's revealed to you. I must not look away from what kings and prophets looked for. Here, you have clearly explained to you today the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the Messiah came and he brought good news first, that he's, it's not yet his day of judgment. It's his day of grace, that he's bringing the good news. And that if you will receive him, that He'll enable you to be a son of God, a daughter of God. And all you have to do is, is just receive him. This is good news. Don't look away from what kings and prophets looked for. When Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of the garden, God told them that there would come a seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. By the way, notice the language. Jesus said, I've given you the power to trample on the scorpions and the serpents. No, notice the connection. Well, Adam and Eve were looking for a son who would crush the head of the serpent. They were looking for Jesus. When Abraham offered Isaac, he was looking for a substitute who would take the place of his son on the altar. He, he was looking for Jesus. When Moses stood before Pharaoh and, and he, he was looking for a lamb whose blood would cause the death angel to pass over the people so the firstborn would not die. Moses was looking for Jesus. When David planned the temple, he was looking for a son who would build a temple that would never be destroyed and who would always sit on the throne. David was looking for Jesus. When Isaiah spoke to Hezekiah and he said, ask for a sign and Hezekiah wouldn't do it, God said, I'll give you one. Uh, there's going to be a virgin who's going to conceive and bring forth a son. And you're going to call his name Emmanuel. <laughs> Isaiah was looking for Jesus. When Jeremiah was in prison, nobody listened to him. He was warning of the coming judgment and they hated him and threw him in prison. And there God shone a, a ray of light and told him there's going to come a new covenant. It's not going to be like the old covenant that your fathers broke. It's going to be one in which my law is written on every heart. And they're all going to know me from the least of them to the greatest. And, and Jeremiah was looking for the one who would bring that new covenant. Jeremiah was looking for Jesus. Kings and prophets Priests and peasants have longed to see the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Anointed One for so long. And now he's come and cast Satan out of heaven. And Satan has fallen like lightning because Jesus has brought the kingdom. Kings and prophets have longed to see the day that is now before you. And yet God in his grace has revealed it to spiritual babies like us, to the foolish and the simple like us. He brought you here today to hear it. He has given you the ability to sit in this sanctuary and to hear this message or to watch it on the internet. And he's speaking to your heart saying today, receive the good news of the gospel and become, uh, receive the power to become a son or a daughter of God. 
what fools, what fools we would be to say no and to have the testimony of a holy God one day in judgment say to you, I gave you an opportunity. You heard the gospel preached and you refused to accept the good news and it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for you. What fools we are to look away from the face of this king or to refuse his will in any area of life, especially faith. If unbelief is the greatest sin, then faith is the greatest obedience. 